Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. Oh my goodness, I am not quite sure we're there yet. Good morning, church, happy Sabbath. Oh, there we go. Um, today, today we're going to go ahead and start our praise um, with this little light of mine. Next song we're going to sing is Humble Thyself in the Sight of the Lord. Our next song is Seek Ye First.
and last song is going to be You Are My All in All. Um, during the second verse, we would like anybody that has um, the need for a petition or just want to come up from, to pray, that would be, it would be done during the second verse. Okay, for those of us that are able to kneel, let us kneel in prayer. Ancient of days, Lord of laws and God of gods, creator, defender, and possessor of the whole universe, of heaven and earth, we thank you for the privilege to be alive. We thank you for the privilege to be able to be healthy enough to come into your sanctuary. We thank you, Lord, because of so many wonderful things that you are doing in our lives that we are not worthy of. We know that today some people slept last night doing well, but they are not able to wake up they are dead. We know that this morning, yesterday there are some people that slept very well. They woke up this morning. They are too sick to come to worship you. And some that slept doing fine yesterday evening, they found themselves this morning in their hospitals. How privileged are we to be at least even healthy enough. Some of us are here. Not doing very well health-wise, but we're healthy enough to come before you in your sanctuary. Lord, I pray for all that are here that are sick, that you will reach out with your merciful hands of healing. And all that are not able to come here because they are sick or because of any other problem, physically or spiritually sick, Lord, touch them at the points of their needs. At this moment, Lord, I want to present to you your son, Jim, that's going to break the bread of life. We pray that you will touch him and fill him with your Holy Spirit and with power from above so that you will use him as a humble instrument of yours to speak out only words that you authorized by the power of your Holy Spirit. At this time, Lord, we pray for the pathfinders that have gone to Gilead. But I will thank you very much for the miracles that you did in Gilead to protect them. We thank you for everything you have done and for your work that has been done in Gilead. Plant a seed in that city, O oh Lord. And we learn that they are already on their way back. Not because they want to travel this morning, but because they are fleeing from the storm. Father in heaven, we pray that you will take care of them and assign your angels to go with them, to go before them, with an invisible pillar of cloud by day and an invisible pillar of fire by night. Lord, please keep watch. Bring them back here safely. Keep watch over those who are traveling to other places in Michigan, those who are traveling to other places in the United States, those who are travel, traveling to, to other places in the world. We learn that about 100 countries were represented. Lord, please be with them. May our angels keep watch and take them safely to their various destinations. This is our humble prayers today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. It's time for the children's story. And I would like to call on you, Delka, to give us the children's story. Thank you.
Good morning, boys and girls. How's everybody doing today? Are you good? You look good, like always. Best part of coming up here is seeing you guys, so it's nice to see you today. So for this story, I went back to when my kids were little again. I even called them up to talk to them about it, like, what do you think I should talk about today? They're like, Mom, do you have the children's story? How about if you run out of stories? I said, I guess with you guys, I never will. <laughs> but So this one actually has to do with our when one of our dogs was a puppy. His name was Jet. Jet was our schnauzer mix. My, we got him from Texas. He was a good dog. But when he was a puppy, he was a little rascal. He was a little rascal. He had big paws, fur that was so soft. He was a cute little dog. And these big brown eyes that looked at you like, you love me, I know it, that kind of dog. He liked to milk it. Well, when he was naughty, he would do things, you know, that I would be like, kids, go see what Jet is doing. Go check up on Jet. Oh, yeah, that dog could... Let's see, what's, what are some of the things he would do? He, oh, I know, one time he chewed through a pair of jeans. Yeah, another time he chewed shoes. Um, oh, there's a dresser that I have at home that you could see his gnaw marks on the legs. Yeah, yeah. So you'd always, if you didn't see him around, you have to check up on him. What is he doing? What is he having in his mouth? Well, this one time, we're in the living room, and all of a sudden I look out the window, and I see a dog fly by. And I said to the kids, wow, that looks like Jet. And they're like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I said, that looks like Jet. And they're like, what? Yeah, I think I see Jet outside. Go check if he's in the backyard, because they had put him in the backyard. Well, Jet wasn't in the backyard, because guess what? He was in the front running around. And... I said to the kids, get over there. You got to go find Jet. He's running the neighborhood. Well, they didn't know how to find him, but they set out. They got their shoes on and off they went. All three of them to go look for Jet and round him up. Well, when I talked to the girls, this is what they told me. They told me that they went running after him. And the more they ran, the faster he got. So they could never reach him. And then one time they said they actually got him cornered. And they went this way, and Jet went the other way, and off he went. So off they ran after him again. He ran, and he ran. I mean, that dog apparently was so, I don't even know what he was running from, but I think in his head it was a game. It was a game. He thought they were playing a game. So he kept running, so much so that he crossed the backyard, and Heather had to run, just climb the fence, to go get him. And even then, when she grabbed him, he ran away again. So off all three of them went after him. They finally were able to catch him, all three of them. They come home with him, and they look, they don't look bad. I said, they look tired, and they're out of breath, but they don't look bad. In fact, I was totally surprised. What, what happened? What did he do? Oh, he was running all over the place. Mom, I even climbed a fence. Look at my hands. I cut up my hands, my daughter said. And the other one said, every time I would reach and grab him, he would run away. Oh, Mom, it was really, really hard. I said, why aren't you guys irritated and mad at him? Oh, we just wanted him back. We didn't want anything to happen to him. We just wanted him back home. We love Jet. We don't want anything to happen to him. And I thought, wow, that is, really, that is really nice. But you have to keep better tabs on him. And so my husband had to fix the gate in the back so he wouldn't escape anymore. I think he would take his big paws and push down the lever, and that's how he would get out. So they, we had to find a way to not let that happen so that Jet could stay where he needed to be. And they weren't running all over the neighborhood looking for him. Well, there's a parable that Jesus told. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. 
and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and rejoices with them. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that if that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Just like my kids were so happy with Jet when they found him, they were petting him and loving on him, even though he was naughty. God is the same way with us. He looks for us. He wants us with him. He wants to love on us, and he embraces us in his arms, no matter if we're good or bad, because he loves us unconditionally. Isn't that great? How many of you are so happy that Jesus loves you so, so much, no matter what? I am, because sometimes I'm a stinker. So I'm very happy Jesus loves me, no matter what. And I know that as you guys are spending your week at home, that you're going to have a great week with your family. And I hope that you keep track of your dogs if you have one, just in case you escape like mine did. All right. Does somebody want to pray? Hmm. Anybody want to pray? Nobody wants to pray? All right. Ready? Close your eyes. I'll pray. Dear Lord, thank you for each and every one of these children. Lord, we know how special they are to you and how much you love them no matter what. May you be with them this week in a special way. We pray this in your name. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. All right. So, um, supposed to be a time for ministry moments, but before uh, I take the ministry moments from uh, from uh, Katie Porter, who is going to do uh, uh, some stuff on food drive, and Brian also will take the fundraiser. But before then, uh, I'm going to take the last reading for the nominating committee. So the, uh, the first reading was read last week, so, and uh, they will receive every complaint and every uh, issue have been sorted, and uh, I'm going to read the names of the nominating uh, committee uh, for today. The chair is Pastor Derek Berrus, and the adult subcommittee members are as follows. Chair, Jim Slater. Then we have the members of the committee as Doug Lafave, Jason Masters, Dennis Madison, Jake Mephalan, and Sharon Mills. And then for the children's subcommittee members, we have uh, Judy Shaw as the chair. And then we have other members as Chris Elger, or Alger. Sorry if I miss uh, call your name. We have Grace Habby Manor. We have Nicole Hoon. We have Yudelka. Orozco, and we have Tracy O'Malley. So these are the names for the nominating committee members, and this is the last reading. So I'm going to ask for a motion. Uh, I want someone to move for a motion to receive uh, these names. Anyone? Okay, I see a motion here. Any seconder? All right. So all in favor, let's say hi, or rest of your heart. Thank you. God bless. All right. So please honestly pray for the members of the, the nominating committee because this job is very, very important, uh, very, very important in the sense that uh, they're going to nominate, nominate the leaders that are going to lead us uh, uh, through uh, coming years. 
Thank you. And I will call on um, who is ready now. Okay, Katie Porter, if you are ready for the food drive, uh, please come forward. Thank you. Good morning, church family. I'm happy to announce that our next food drive will be on Sabbath, August 24th, following the church service. You can look for us probably down the education hallway in one of the classrooms. That's where we'll be set up. We're asking that non-perishable food items be brought in next week, Sabbath, August 17th, and placed on the cart that will be in the foyer. Perishable food items may be brought in the following Sabbath on August 24th and also placed on the cart that will be in the foyer. And we will open the food pantry following church on that day. We're hoping that your gardens will be plentiful so that the pantry will receive your surplus. If you're unable to donate, then please help out by praying that the food drive will be a success. We need your generosity and support. Recent food drives have helped about a dozen families here, and also food boxes are packed and delivered to our homebound by church members. Please remember the food drive is this month on Sabbath, August 24th. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful work you're doing, uh, Katie. God bless. Uh, Brian, take the. Good morning, church. Uh, I just wanted to make a quick, quick announcement. Uh, the Academy will be doing a golf outing September 13th, which is a Friday morning at Grand Valley State University's course, The Meadows. Um, anyone is welcome to come play. It's a fun little event. There's not a typical golf, you know, you're not playing by yourself. You're playing with a team of four people. Um, and it's, it, there's fun at kind of holes that will have different activities and stuff that are just outsor outside of the normal kind of golf uh, viewpoint. So please, um, if you could spread the word, if you're interested, go online to graa.com and register. Um, you can either register as an individual player or as a team or even as a sponsor or donor. Um, those, those options are available. Um, but please pray uh, for us as we uh, try to raise as much funds as we can. Um, last year, we raised about $5,000. So we're hoping to exceed that this year. Um, so yeah, please. Thank you very much, Brian, for the wonderful job you're doing to raise money for our school, GRAA. Very, very important. Adventist education is actually the best. So if we have, especially if we have the best resources in personal and in finance. Thank you. All right, so it's time to, to worship God in our finances. So today's um, offering is going to NAD uh, Christian Records Services. So uh, we've already talked a little bit during the Sabbath school, we talked much about uh, tithes and offering, how God asks us to bring as a test of faith one tenth of our income as tithe and then offering as much. And God says that it is a test. I don't want to write an exam and, fa and then fail. I don't want to write a test and fail. So please, let's read hard, study hard, so that we can pass the test. Amen? So it's time to call on the... Uh, Deacons to come forward as we pray. Let us pray. Merciful and gracious God in heaven, what a privilege, what a privilege to participate in giving. And you've said we should give to you just one tenth and you say, it's a test of faith because you own the cattle in a thousand hills. You own the whole universe. You even say, if you were hungry, 
You know how to take care of yourself. You created everything. But you made us even know this is an AC. This is just something that has been meant, uh, made available for us even be before the exam. You told us the answer to the questions before the test. Lord, what a privilege to participate in this test. Help us to pass this test. We want to pass. We don't want to fail any exam, especially the one that has been set by you. Therefore, we surrender to you and ask for the mind, the Holy Spirit, for the power, for the heart of giving willingly so that you will open the windows of heaven and show our blessings of, upon us that there may be no, no enough room to contain them. And above all, you went ahead and said, you will rebuke the devourer. Oh Lord, I thank you that you will rebuke the devourer. Who is the devourer? The one that devour our money, devour our health, devour our freedom, devour all that are important to us. This is Satan. Because he came to kill and to steal and to destroy. He is a devourer. You ask that when we bring our heart and surrender to you in terms of tithes and offering, that you will rebuke this devourer. Lord, do it for us, for we surrender to you. In Jesus Christ's mighty name, amen.
to the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come bodily unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Can we say amen again for that reading? Praise God for that. And Gia Maro, thank you so much for the special music. If you look at your bulletin, that's uh, not your name listed. So I know that you jumped in here at the last minute to help us out. And what a beautiful, beautiful song. You know, we're told that singing is as much a part of worship as praying. And I would say it's as much a, a part of worship as preaching. And you already preached a message to us today that we just come to Jesus and he will make all things new. 
What a powerful message. And I hope we take that to heart. How many of you here have had a great week? You see a few hands. I won't ask for the hands that perhaps we wish it would have been better. But there are weeks like that. And I know this week in particular, it was already mentioned, we've been praying for our Pathfinder Club. They're on their way back. Um, some of you know that there was some severe weather that went through Gillette, Wyoming, a real challenge to the Pathfinder Club. I think at one point there might have been 30 or 40% of the Pathfinder Clubs were either underwater or their area had been washed out. So there's definitely been some challenges and there's reports that there's another storm cell even bigger. Um, they had 70 mile an hour winds and there may be even higher winds that are coming. And so I know that this evening's program has been canceled and, and the clubs are, are leaving early. But let's pray for them that they would have safety coming back. We've got tens of thousands of young people traveling, young people who want to give their heart or have given their heart to Jesus, who are making their way back not only to our state but around the country and around the world. Um, and in a special way, I, I just want to lift them up uh, here today. But as we get started, before we start the sermon, let's just bow our heads and, and ask not only for God's protection there, but God would watch over us here because we're here to gain a blessing that the Holy Spirit would be poured out. And let's ask for him to be here with us today. Dear God, thank you so much for what we've already experienced here today with our Sabbath school classes and the studies that have taken place from the, from the very youngest of us all the way through the oldest. We thank you for the opportunity to worship. We know that you've promised that where two or three are gathered in your name, you will be here also. And we claim that promise and ask for your presence that we would be, uh, that the Holy Spirit would be poured out, that we would be baptized in the presence of the Holy Spirit here today as we seek to come closer to you. In a very special way, we ask that you be with our Pathfinder clubs from around the world as they travel back. Um, we know that a blessing happened. It may not have been everything that had been planned because of the weather, but we know, Lord, that you are in charge and that you are able to turn something wonderful out of something that perhaps was not perfect. Uh, in fact, that's what you do for each of us in our own life. But bless them and keep them safe as they travel back. May they have a wonderful story to tell about your protection and watch care over them as they go through your life, and, or their life. And we ask this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So a few years, years ago, um, as this often happens, I had a conference out in California. And many times when I'm out on a conference from work, I'll see if there's something there in, in the area where I'm going that I can do some type of what I like to call an epic experience. And it was too early in the season to get into some place like Yosemite or further north in California, but I realized that being in San Diego, I wasn't that far from Death Valley. And so I made a decision to travel a few hours to Death Valley with the, the goal of walking across the valley. Now, I wasn't going to walk the whole length. For those of you that know anything about Death Valley, Death Valley is about 130 or 140 miles long, north to south, but it's really only about 5 to 15 miles wide, depending on where you're at. And so I decided that I would, uh, my epic experience was going to be, I want to walk across Death Valley. Now, how many of you here know very much about Death Valley? Some of you do. I'll, I'll give you a couple of interesting facts. Number one, it has the highest recorded temperature anywhere on Earth, 134 degrees. Now, when they measure uh, worldwide to compare uh, temperatures, apparently they have all these weather stations, temperature stations, and it's exactly 4 feet 11 inches off the ground, and that's standardized, so you're getting the air temperature. You're not getting the ground temperature. But that temperature of 134,000 is currently the highest recorded, verified, uh, or at least fairly verified, uh, temperature in the world for air temperature. So it gets warm there. Now, it gets hotter at the ground. As you can imagine, especially if it's dry, the, uh, the, the temperature and the heat, the sunlight, and with dark soil or dark rocks, it can get even uh, higher. And they've actually recorded a temperature at ground level in Death Valley at 201 degrees Fahrenheit. So it gets hot. It gets very, very warm. Um, now, the fact that it gets that hot, though, doesn't mean that people haven't lived there before. And for a while, there was an indigenous Indian tribe that lived there. And back in the 1950s, as uh, people in America were traveling west for the, uh, 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 the gold rush in California, they would come to Death Valley and they would try to cross it. And, and sometimes they were unsuccessful. Uh, there was one group where 13 people died being stuck uh, in Death Valley, and that's how it got its name. 
But people were able to find a way to have um, a, a life experience to live. And in fact, they found that as they began to kind of search the soil and stuff, that there were heavy concentrations of material used to make something called borax. Now, how many of you here know what borax is? Some of the, um, the, the more mature, experienced people here recognize that borax is often used as a cleaning detergent. In fact, how many of you here recognize something called 20 mule train borax? There was actually a very specific brand. That borax was mined in Death Valley. And the gentleman that figured this out knew that uh, the, uh, the stuff that you have to use or, or carry out was very, fairly heavy. You had to have large wagons to do this. And so it limited how much you could carry out at a time. And he figured mathematically that the more mules that you had, the more you could carry out exponentially. And so he actually created these 20 mule teams, 20 mule mule teams to cart this stuff off. And if you go and you look at the box, you'll see a big wagon and 20 mules carrying the borax out. But Death Valley is not just the hottest place on earth, it's also one of the driest. And it happens to be uh, very, very dry, but on average they get about two inches of rain per year. And it's hot enough that you can actually evaporate 150 inches of water per year. And one of the things that's interesting about Death Valley is not only is it hot, not only is it dry, but it is also one of the lowest places in the world. In fact, in the Northern Hemisphere, Badwater Basin, 282 feet below sea level. And so what that means in the western part of the U.S., it actually acts as a drain, where you may get very, very little water. You may get some additional runoff that comes in, but it all evaporates. And as you can imagine, when, when you get rain or you get water and it drains in a particular area, if all the water evaporates, what's left? Salt other minerals, etc. And so I had made a decision that I was going to walk across Death Valley. And so I started at Badwater Basin, 282 feet below sea level, and I began to walk across the valley. And what I found is as you go out a few feet, you can see a couple of people in the distance here. Uh, I took the picture just before I started walking. People will often walk out the first 100, maybe 200 yards and say, hey, I, was, I walked out on Death Valley, and they'll come back. But very few people wander past that. And as I began to walk across the valley, about midway I stopped and I took this picture, looking to the north. And what you can see there is, is the sediment that's left after all the water has evaporated. You have these uh, like crystallized salt, these huge hexagons. Uh, the picture doesn't really show the, the, uh, the perspective, but those little ridges were probably four to six, maybe eight inches tall and those hexagons were, were maybe six, eight feet or more across. And I took this picture, and what was interesting about taking this picture is as I began to walk, I'm walking across, and I noticed that there's a lot of wind. In fact, that particular day, the winds were 50, maybe 60 miles an hour, and at the very north end of, of the uh, Death Valley, there's just one road that comes in, there's some sand dunes. They actually had to close the, sand, the road down because it was like a sandstorm and people couldn't see. So I'm walking across, it was probably 95 degrees, uh, and I'll just add this, it was crazy, you know, you would think in 95 degree weather as you're hiking in the sun that it would be hot. Um, by the way, you've heard the story, you don't worry because it's a dry heat, right? <laughs> it is hot, but the temperature, even though it was hot because evaporation, it was so dry and because of the wind, I was actually cold walking in 95 degree weather because the wind was so strong. And I took this picture, and I had a hat on. You can imagine why. You just take a look. I had a hat on for protection, and I took the hat off because I didn't want anything to happen when I took the picture. And I tucked it under my arm, and I'm taking the picture, and then I had taken my backpack off because I had plenty of water and Gatorade and some snacks. And I reached down to pick up the backpack, and I go to grab my hat, and my hat is gone. I was like, what happened? So I'm looking on the ground, and I don't see it anywhere, and I look up, and the wind had taken the hat from underneath my arm and it was blowing it up the valley. And I realized I need to get that hat. I'm in the middle of Death Valley and it's 95 degrees. I am miles from anyone. No one else was out there. 
It was the most surreal, most, I wouldn't call it lonely, but it was the most alone experience I've ever had. And I recognized if anything happens to me, there is no one out here and there won't be anyone for a long time. And so I started running up the valley to catch my hat. And the wind would pick it up and it would keep blowing it. And what I found is that the more I ran, the farther the hat was getting away. And I immediately re recognized I needed to drop my backpack, so I dropped my backpack and I tried to run faster. And I still had my Gatorade with me, and I realized I can't even run with my Gatorade, and I dropped the Gatorade. And I'm taking off running up the valley, watching that hat blow further and further and further away. And I probably ran a half a mile before providentially, somehow the, the, uh, the back of the hat caught on some of those salt crystals. And I was finally able to get it, pick it up, put it on, walk back the half mile to my uh, um, Gatorade in my backpack and continue the journey. But as I journeyed on, I noticed going across the, can or, or across the, uh, the valley that the ground began to change. And what started out as this very firm, solid ground, yes, it had solid crystals and it had other minerals, etc., but it was, it was very firm. It started to get softer. And as time went on, it got soft enough that I started breaking through this crust. And underneath it was mud. And the more I walked, the deeper that mud would get. And it was interesting mud. Later on, after I had gotten back and, and uh, th this had all dried out, it had caked on so hard it was like cement. But as I'm walking across, I'm recognizing this is, this is getting worse. Should I keep going or should I stop? Maybe it's time to turn around. And it was that point when I was asking myself that question that I happened to look over to one side. And what I saw was that there was another set of footprints. And so I took a picture. The, the deeper ones are my uh, footprints, what I've just walked through. And you can see that there's another set of footprints that someone else had walked across the valley and they had kept going. And I figured if they have done it, I can too. And so I continued to follow these footsteps as they went across the valley because I knew if someone else had made it, I could too. I remember being out there and thinking about the verse in Psalms. The Bible says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear for no evil, for you are with me. Friends, how many times are we going through an experience and we wonder, can I keep going? And the Bible tells us that someone is with us, that Jesus is here. That in the middle of a valley called death, this experience of life, that Jesus has been here already and already gone through it. But I want to share with us that sometimes I think we look at this text and we, we envision that God is here or Jesus is here, but he's here as an observer. That somehow he's watching and maybe if necessary he'll kind of interview, but he's just watching what we're doing as an observer as rather than a participant. I think about, you know, right now we're in the middle of the Olympics and we have all these athletes who are competing. And in addition to the athletes, you have judges or you have referees, people who are part of that um, event, but they're not actually experiencing the event. Do you know what I'm talking about? Maybe it's in a football game, you have the referees. But my Bible tells me that Jesus didn't just come as an observer. That when he was here on, on earth... He experienced everything that we experience. And so we find that here in Hebrews, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. In other words, there's nothing that we can experience that Jesus hasn't already gone through. And sometimes we forget about that. Like, can Jesus really understand what I'm going through? Does Jesus really know what this is like? And so I want to take a couple minutes to show, uh, have us go to the Bible and find out what are the ways that Jesus experienced life, human life, just like we did. And what I found, number one, is that Jesus experienced physical needs. We sometimes forget. We know that he's God. We know that he came here to die for our sins. But what, did he really experience life the way we do physically? And the Bible says yes. He absolutely did. We have here in Mark eleven twelve. 12, it says, Now the next day when they had come from Bethany, he was what? 
He was hungry. How many of you here today woke up hungry? Okay. How many of none of us ate today? How many of us tomorrow would wake up hungry? Most of us would. Most of us at one point in our life, more than just the typical, hey, I had breakfast and now it's time to eat lunch. I'm getting a little hungry. Jesus knows what it's like to be hungry. He had that physical experience. But it wasn't just hunger. We find in John 19 that it says this. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished and in order the scripture would be fulfilled, said, I am thirsty. Jesus was thirsty. Now, maybe at times we've been more thirsty than hungry. How many of you here have ever been thirsty? Jesus knows what it's like to be physically thirsty and desire something to drink. And then finally, we have this in John 4, 6. It says, Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. Friends, if we have ever been physically tired, if we ever felt I just need to rest, Jesus knows exactly what that's like. Now, the question I have for us today is this. All of us at one time have been hungry, we've been thirsty, we've been tired. What tends to happen to us when we're hungry, thirsty, and tired? What's that? We get cranky. There's a, a new word, maybe it's not new, but relatively new. It's called hanger. I got hangry. Why? Because I'm angry, because I'm hungry. Right? How many of you have ever, maybe you don't want to admit it. So my sister's here. Uh, many of you know my sister, Janine. This is not about her, but she would tell the story that when I was little, oftentimes this would happen after church because, you know, we'd go to church, my dad was the organist, or we, even if we were visiting our relatives, the church service, if it went long, my parents were always, and my grandparents, the last ones to leave, and then we had to go home, and then you have to make the meal. And my, my sister, Janine, would tell you that when I was little, very little, <laughs> on those, I would start crying. I don't know how many of you here have ever been hungry to the point of crying. I can tell you from experience, a long time ago, uh, you can get hungry to the point of crying. We tend to get upset. We tend to have an emotional experience. Jesus knows what it's like to be hungry, to be thirsty, to be tired. And the question is, do we realize that Jesus also had emotional experiences? Now, the Bible tells us all these things happened and he did not sin. But we know that Jesus didn't just experience life physically the way we do. Jesus also experienced human emotions. And so the Bible tells us here in Luke, it says, in that hour, Luke 10, 21, in that hour, Jesus, what does it say? Rejoiced. He rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to babes. In other words, Jesus knows what it's like to be happy and excited. Now, I want to contrast that. I use the example that at times there are people that are going through an experience in sports, but they're not actually in the game. You have people who are referees. How many times have we seen a referee cheering, high-fiving a team when they've made a touchdown? It doesn't happen. We look at these people because they're supposed to be somewhat distanced emotionally from what's taking place. They have a, 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 an object that they need to do. They have a task that they need to do. But they're not actually in the game. My Bible says that Jesus was here and he experienced life the same way we do. And when something good happened, he rejoiced. He was happy. He was excited. The Bible also says this in Mark 3, 5. It says, and when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to, uh, to the man, stretch out your hand. So the Bible tells us that not only would, could Jesus be happy, not only would he be excited, not only would he rejoice, but the Bible says that Jesus looked at them with anger. Now let me ask you something. Is anger a sin? We often think that it is, but the book of Psalms says, in your anger, do not sin. So there's a difference between us having an emotional experience and actually sinning. And God says, don't sin if you're anger. But the Bible tells us that there were several times where Jesus was upset. He was angry, a righteous anger at what his own children were doing to other children of his. But more than just happiness and anger, the Bible says in Isaiah 53, 3, he is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with what? With grief, with sadness. 
You know, a lot of times we say, I don't know that Jesus can really understand what I'm going through. There are certain things that we say, I don't think that Jesus can relate. I've heard people say before, Jesus was never married. He doesn't know what it's like to go through a divorce. Jesus never had children. He doesn't know what it's like to lose a child. My Bible tells me that Jesus talked about his relationship with the church. His relationship with the children of Israel in the same way that he would describe the relationship between a man and his bride. And he talks about how he was rejected by his bride and how many times he said that she was unfaithful to him. Friends, Jesus knows what it's like to experience the depth of our sadness and human emotion. Jesus knows what it's like to lose a child. Lucifer, who stood in the presence of God himself in heaven, turned against God, turned against Jesus. There is nothing that we've experienced that Jesus hasn't also experienced as well. But we know this, Jesus didn't just experience what we experience physically or emotionally, but Jesus experienced our spiritual warfare as well. We see this in Mark 1.13, and it says, and, and he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan and with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Did Jesus experience temptation? Yes, absolutely. And by the way, not only is he experiencing temptation in the wilderness, but he's been there already for 40 days not eating. I have no idea how he was able to do that, but he did in his humanity, in Jesus' humanity, he did not sin even when he was tempted. And one of the reasons was because Jesus understood something very, very important about the spiritual experience. Because the Bible says that Jesus prayed. It says, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and he, he prayed. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. How many of us here, friends, have prayed and it feels like God isn't answering? I know there are times that people have said, you know, I've been praying and it just doesn't seem like God hears me. Ellen White talks about the fact that three times in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus prayed that what was before him would be taken away. And each time, she says, heaven was silent, that there wasn't an answer. Friends, I want to tell you something. If you are praying and it feels like you're not getting an answer, Jesus knows how that feels because he's experienced that as well. And at times when he was praying, if he wasn't getting an answer, the Bible says he prayed more earnestly. Friends, we need to pray more earnestly, even if we feel that there's not an answer. God is asking us to follow what Jesus has done. But I share these things because it's easy for us to think that somehow Jesus doesn't really understand. My Bible says that Jesus experienced the full depth and the full breadth, the entire experience of humanity. And because of that, Ellen White writes this about that experience that we now have. It says, through all our trials, we have a never-failing helper. He does not leave us alone to struggle with temptation, to battle with evil, and finally be crushed with burdens and sorrow. Though he is hidden from mortal sight, the ear of faith can hear his voice saying, fear not, I am with you. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive evermore. I have endured your sorrows, experienced your struggles, encountered your temptations. I know your tears, I also have wept. The griefs that lie too deep to be breathed into any human ear, I know. Think not that you are desolate and forsaken. Though your pain touch no responsive cord in any heart on earth, look unto me and live. She goes down, the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. Friends, Jesus knows exactly what we're going through in every single circumstance. And there is never a time that we can't go to him. So I want to go back to what we talked about at the beginning even though the, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but in all points was tempted as we are yet without sin. And I think that there's something very important embedded in that last text that sometimes we miss, because we know who the high priest is, do we not? Our high priest is who? It's Jesus. 
So this text is talking about Jesus, that Jesus can sympathize with us. But what's interesting is it doesn't call him by that name. And we know that Jesus has many roles, many names here. We know that he is the creator, that through him all things were made. But this doesn't say that we have a creator who can sympathize with us. We know he's the Lamb of God. John said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the earth. But it doesn't say that the Lamb of God knows everything that we've gone through. We know that Jesus will someday stand in judgment, but it doesn't say that we have a judge or an advocate. We know that Jesus will return as a conquering king, but it doesn't say that we have a conquering king who can sympathize with us. It says we have a high priest. And what that tells me is that there's something unique about Jesus' role as a high priest that makes this important. That we understand Jesus in his role as a high priest knows what we're going through. And the question is, why is that? So I want to just take a couple minutes to talk about Jesus' role as a high priest. And in order to understand the role of the high priest, we first of all have to understand the sanctuary. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into this. I'm going to tell you that if you're interested in understanding the sanctuary, which, by the way, when we understand the sanctuary, we understand the fundamental uh, principles that underline all of our doctrines. When we begin to understand the sanctuary, we have a deeper understanding of our biblical doctrines. But the point of the sanctuary is this, that God created mankind perfect and holy, and man sinned. And because of that, there was a separation, that God had to be separated from mankind. But he said, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, that God wanted to be part of our life here on earth. And so he said, build a sanctuary. And as part of that process, I want there to be a mediator because I want to be as close as possible as I can to mankind. And so we had the children of Israel build the sanctuary. And in that sanctuary, there were two parts. There was a holy place and a most holy place. And again, I'm not going to take the time to go through all this. Uh, again, Jake McFarland is leading a study on the sanctuary every Wednesday night in prayer meeting. Powerful study. I encourage all of us to be there. But we often think about the role of the high priest is that the high priest would minister once a year in what was called the, the most holy place. And that's where the atonement for sin would take place where sin would be erased and eradicated. And what the Bible tells us is this, in Hebrews 8, 5, that what we had here on earth was a copy. It was a shadow of the heavenly things, that what God instituted here on earth was to show us what was really going to be taking place in heaven with this salvation experience. And so we know that as here on earth, there was an earthly high priest who ministered in the most holy place that would bring atonement. And by the way, the word atonement means at oneness. That one of the roles of the high priest was to make us at one again with Jesus Christ. Jesus was the high priest, actually to make oneness with God. Jesus was the high priest. His blood, by the way, is the one that brings atonement. So Jesus was both the sacrifice and the high priest, but the high priest was the one that would do this ceremony. And we now have Jesus as our high priest in heaven. That what we had here on earth was pointing forward to what the ministry that he would have in heaven where he would make us at one with God. But it wasn't just the day of atonement where the high priests were doing their work. There was another very important job that they had. That the priests and the high priests made sure that every day there was incense. In addition to all of their other duties, and we don't have time to go through them today, that part of that, that uh, experience was that each day there would be incense, and the incense was placed at the very back of the, of the holy place, and as the incense would rise, it would rise up uh, along that curtain or that robe, and it would flow over to the other side, which is where the presence of God was. And the Bible tells us, uh, again, David writes, that our prayers ascend like incense that that incense represented prayers. And this is important because one of the roles of the priest and the high priest is that they would pray for God's people. And so we find this here when we go back. The importance for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but in all points was tempted as we are yet without sin. But it goes on, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in, to help in time of need. Friends, God knew that there would be a time when we're in need. 
that we needed more than just to be forgiven for the sins that we had already committed. That we would find ourselves in battle with temptation and we would need a high priest that understood what it was like. And so we find this earlier in Hebrews. It says, therefore, in all things he had, meaning Jesus, who is our high priest, in all things he had to be make, made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make, uh, to make, uh, propi- I had this all figured out. Can someone just remind me how to say this again? Propitiation. Thank you. Make propitiation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Friends, it's not just that Jesus forgives us through his blood when we sin. It's that when we need help in temptation, that he knows what it's like to be tempted. And because he never sinned, he can help us not to sin as well. Friends, do we want to continue sinning and asking for forgiveness? Or do we want the power to be like Jesus? I want us to have the power to be like Jesus. When I was walking across Death uh, Death Valley, there came a point where the mud was really getting too deep. And I recognized that in safety and, and, you know, just a marginal amount of wisdom, I probably shouldn't go any further, and I made the decision to turn back. And it was disappointing. I wanted so much to be able to say I walked all the way across Death Valley, and I was maybe only a quarter of a mile or or so. I could see the little bushes on the other side where the the valley uh, ended. But I turned back. But the footprints kept going. And it's a reminder that we have experienced humanity only with our own experience, that what we have experienced is not the fullness of all human experience, but just like those footprints kept going, Jesus has experienced everything that we could ever experience and more than we ever will. And because of that, he is our great help in time of need. And so I'm wondering, friends, so often we talk about, can we, can we find a way to make Jesus more relevant? Can we find a way that makes Jesus more meaningful or more like us? I wonder if instead of trying to make Jesus more like us, Jesus who has already experienced everything that could possibly happen in the human experience, instead of making Jesus more like us, shouldn't we let Jesus make us more like him? That what God is wanting us to do is to look to Jesus and be changed. That Jesus experienced everything that we experienced so we could never come and say, I don't think you understand what I'm going through. That instead we would come and say, Jesus, I know that you have gone through this as well. And with your power and with your help, will you let me overcome? 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22 says this, For... To this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should what? That we should follow his steps. Jesus who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Friends, how many of us today want to be like Jesus? How many of us here today acknowledge that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? We are all in need of an intercessor who can bring salvation, forgiveness for our sins. But more than that, that that same power that we can reach out to for forgiveness of sins can enable us to overcome and to be made like Jesus. Friends, if that's your desire today, that we would spend our time looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of of the race, of our life, what he's doing in us, we would look to him in order that we too could be like Jesus. If that's your goal today, if that's your prayer, I invite you to stand with me as we have our closing hymn, I Would Be Like Jesus.
kids are never an interruption of on, up on the pulpit. Amen. Thank you, kids, so much. What a beautiful message that you sang to us. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear God, thank you so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for our sins, but to live that we can overcome sin and we can be like him. Lord, fill us with the presence of the Holy Spirit as we live here today, given the power that he's offered us, that we can, too can be over, overcomers. And as we look to you, as we look to Jesus for our salvation, Lord, may we continually walk closer and closer. Bless us to that end as we leave. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Thank you.